We're here at World Time Attack 2017 with Will from PZ Tuning all the way from Canada. Now Will's brought his 2012 Civic Coupe over to compete in the Pro-Am class here at World Time Attack. Now Will, this car is for big commitment to bring it all the way over from Canada. Uh, you've built it really to run in the US uh, Global Time Attack and Grid Life series though. Uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, what you need to be competitive in those series. Well, I, I think the one major difference between World Time Attack and where we run locally um, is the classing. We have drivetrain classes in North America, so we have front wheel drive class, rear wheel drive class, and all wheel drive class. Um, versus coming to here to World Time Attack, um, you know, the program category is drivetrainless. So definitely one of the things where when we were preparing the car was to make sure we maximize this car regardless of drivetrain and make sure it was competitive within that class. Um, so and that's a really good point because you're talking here about a front wheel drive car. It's turbocharged and making a lot of power, which we'll talk about shortly. But uh, you're trying to compete on a, an even playing field with rear wheel drive and probably more importantly four wheel drive. So how much of a disadvantage does the front wheel drive chassis give you? Well, I, I, I'm not going to say it's much of, much of a disadvantage more than you have to build it differently. Um, and I, I, definitely even in America, the times have come down between the platforms. Um, earlier in the year at Road Atlanta, we actually won that event outright, um, which was the first time for a front wheel drive car at a global time attack event, as we found out. Um, so it's 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 I think the misconceptions were previously uh, it was like just looked at as such a massive disadvantage. Now I think there's strong suits that you can really bring to the table, and it, you can actually make it competitive. It's just believing in, in designing the car around that platform. Okay, so let's take take that into account. What what do you do when you know you're designing a front wheel drive platform? What are the main design criteria that you need to keep in mind to really maximize that front wheel drive platform and uh, optimize the advantages that it gives? Well, definitely with a front wheel drive car, you really have those front wheel tires doing basically 80% of the job. It's steering, it's braking in, it's putting the power down. So you really got to make sure that the car can put that power down. This car is unique where it, it makes a lot of torque. It probably makes, um, you know, it's got 540 foot-pounds of torque, so applying that to a front-wheel drive platform normally is a big disadvantage. But with traction control and with proper management of um, geometry, you can really put that power down. Um, which, like again, you know, whereas it might have been looked at as a massive disadvantage, we actually have some acceleration times coming out of corners that are, you know, pretty close to the fastest out there. And I'm going to assume as well, with front wheel drive, everything's quite compact. Uh, you don't have a rear differential, drive shaft, right. centre differentials. Uh, a weight advantage there? Uh, not with this chassis. This chassis is actually 1,040 kilograms as we are sitting right now. So it's definitely not on the lightweight side of things right now. And that'll be definitely something we'll be improve upon as we keep developing this car. Um, something that, you know, we... The car is only two and a half years old, really, so um, there's still a lot of development left in it. And compared to many of our competitors, where they've been working on the same chassis for a long time, we're still we're still in that initial stage of getting data and, and using, um, you know, that to our advantage in development. So. In terms of the power, let, let's talk about that for a little bit. Obviously that's another area that we've seen. Uh, the power levels continue to climb year after year here at World Time Attack. I'm going to guess uh, Global Time Attacks may be similar. Uh, so you're running a K-series engine and this one's turbocharged. Tell us a little bit about that engine package. Yeah, so it's a K24A2. It's uh, fully built with LA sleeves, ductile iron sleeves inside it, CP pistons, uh, Brian Crower rods and cams and springs and retainers. Turbo, we actually use a Borg Warner EFR 9174. Um, we were actually one of the first teams to ever use it, and it's been great. Wicked partnership with that company. Um, excellent power band. So from basically 4,000 RPM on, it starts building boost from 4,400 to 8,800 RPM redline. We basically have a torque curve that's about 470 foot-pounds throughout that, no lower than that. So it's really drivable. It's You could be up a gear, down a gear, and, and you pretty much can still lay on the power. 
Now, I just want to go back to that turbo. The, so the 9174 is one of the more recent releases from Borg Warner, and uh, the 9180s, I guess they're they're big bad boy, the biggest in their range. So the 9174 uh, combines that bigger compressor wheel uh, with a slightly smaller turbine wheel, right. so better for uh, boost response on a smaller engine like this. Yeah, and, and that was one of the design criteria. So when we were um, originally planning this car, actually back in 2014. Um, we were talking to the engineers at Borg Warner, and they uh, they actually have a really cool uh, program called Matchbot. I don't know if you've used Matchbot. Um, so Brian Reinhardt uh, actually Im inputted all my parameters into Matchbot, and he's like, "Will we have a turbo that's going to pretty much do everything you're going to need? It's going to have the spool, it's going to have the power, it's going to have the transient response." And it's not out yet, but it's going to be out very shortly. And when we get one produced, we're going to send it your way. Um, so literally, uh, February 2015 came along. He went to the production line, packaged one up, and serial number two ended up in my lap. <laughs> it's nice to have a relationship with a supplier like that and get those parts uh, ahead of the rest of the world. Uh, what sort of um, power is it actually producing, and what sort of boost are you running it at? So we've dynoed up to 793 wheel horsepower at 24 pounds of boost. Um, we also, earlier configuration was 771 at only 21 pounds of boost, so we know the efficiency is really there. Um, we're still on an internal wastegate on this setup, which is pretty, you know, at this power level, kind, kind of unique. Um, and I think we're right at the threshold of where that turbine, the 0.92 AR housing is just, you know, maxing out right now. In the uh, Honda tuning world for World Time Attack, we've seen a lot of competitors running uh, the Rochex Supercharger. It's, it's always been a popular choice with that front wheel drive platform simply because of the uh, power delivery characteristics, very linear boost response versus RPM. Uh, so does the turbocharger give you some, uh, some trouble uh, maintaining and controlling that power delivery? Uh, the answer would be yes if we didn't have an awesome traction control system, but with advanced traction control and boost by, boost, boost by throttle and boost by gear, it really changes that. So with our MoTeC system, we've, we've actually have it, so not only is it boost by gear dependent, so second gear, third gear have less power obviously than fourth gear and fifth gear, but it's also throttle position related too. So at 50% throttle, we only have probably seven or eight pounds of boost, and then as we get up to you know full 100% TPS will actually increase that boost level to you know the, the max the max I, it's set up for. I think that's a, an area that a lot of people really overlook and don't understand with a turbocharger uh, they're simply so good at producing boost that without that sort of throttle position based boost control you can back out of the throttle but it will actually maintain your maximum boost target right down until you get to maybe 50 or 60 percent throttle so you have a very non-linear torque versus throttle position and that particularly in a traction limited car uh, can present a lot of problems for the driver to actually modulate the power. Would that be a fair assumption? Absolutely. Like when, So when we were setting up the Motec, one of the things, my, my, my tuner is Sasha Nice from On Point Dino, he, we, we spent a day at the track and basically we were just doing logs, watching our traction and setting up so this car could use it in the best way and not waste energy and not use excessive traction control. The worst thing you want to do is have full boost and have the traction control pull back so much timing that it's all it's doing is generating heat and not actually really you know improving the car's ability. So you're really trying to get that base uh, power delivery to to really match the available traction and then you're using that traction control just as a, a last ditch effort in case you really do just overpower the track to pull everything back? Absolutely. So. Def definitely, definitely the way to do it on a high torque front wheel drive setup. Like you said, with a supercharged setup, where with the Rotrex, where the, the the torque delivery comes on and, and it's linear to RPM, it's much easier to control, especially coming out of a slow speed corner. With a turbo tr charged engine, you hit maximum boost and you make, basically make maximum torque. So wheel spin is basically prevalent. So if you don't have all the advanced mapping in place to, to boost mapping in place, you're just gonna wheel spin everywhere. Now let's talk about that electronics package and what you're using to to control the the traction and also the uh, the boost uh, per gear boost versus throttle position. Uh, you've said you're running a Motec ECU. Can you give us a little bit more information? Absolutely, we're running a Motec M130 ECU. Um, it's coupled with a C125 dash. Uh, we have the Lambda feedback on it, so it's it's a pretty awesome package. We've you know obviously the boost by gear, like I was saying, but even even having closed loop feedback 
Um, our previous ECU didn't have closed loop boost feedback. And again, just, just all the advancements and ability of that system is incredible. Um, earlier today, we had Mark from MoTeC come and help us, you know, fine tune all the settings, get everything working exactly to its potential. And um, I think he's going to come by tomorrow and just look at our data that we, we collected and make sure that we're going on the right path. Um, lots to learn with the system. It's, it's incredibly advanced. There's almost endless options and endless adjustments that can be made. Um, and for me, I'm just scratching the surface with it right now. I just wanted to talk about the drivetrain in the car, again with a, a powerful front wheel drive car that's always a challenge holding a, a transmission together or coming out with a transmission that can uh, adequately put that power to the ground and uh, also change gear quickly and consistently. So what are you doing uh, on that front? So um, from a transmission standpoint we run a Quaif gearbox, the Quaif 5 speed sequential. Uh, we run a competition clutch twin disc clutch, and it can it doesn't slip, so it basically puts every single foot pound into the actual for transmission. For shift cut, we implement again a strain gauge shift knob into the MoTeC ECU. Um, that was actually one thing we were been setting up this weekend was we were actually having some premature um, gear cuts. Yeah, gear cuts happening on the straight. Um, we I've never driven on a track coming down a main straight where it's quite as bumpy as this track, and so we had to change the sensitivity levels just so uh, it, it wasn't you know making a shift cut down the street um, but other than that it's it's pretty amazing and that that's what mark mark mark's specialty is actually doing the gear train or the drive train and so he went in and he did a bunch of little changes with us and showed us where we could you know squeeze out a faster shift and c get that power back on quicker so as we make a shift it we're not losing that much speed actually from that shift. Uh, so with the ability for you to control those shifts through the MoTeC, obviously you've still got a, a mechanical lever in there, you're f physically Absolutely. pulling the lever, it's not paddle shifted, uh, but you also have the ability to uh, auto blip the throttle on the downshift, is that a function you're using in the MoTeC or are you manually doing that? I'm manually doing at this mo point in time, um, we have we were discussing earlier today about getting a drive-by-wire solution and actually implementing all that features into it. Oh, so you're still on cable throttle? I'm still on a cable throttle. Oh look, it's an amazing car, it's making some insane power and considering this is your first time here at Sydney Motorsport Park to already be running uh, second in the Pro-Am field uh, is a pretty impressive effort. You've broken under that uh, 1 minute 30 barrier with a 129.6 was it? Yeah, 129.637 I think. So it bodes well for tomorrow and a little bit more experience with uh, the track as well. Uh, we certainly wish you all the best for competition tomorrow. Thanks for chatting to us, Will. Thank you very much. If you liked that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson. You'll learn about performance engine building and EFI tuning, and you'll also have the chance to ask questions which I'll be answering live. Remember, it's 100% free, so follow the link to claim your spot.